Thomas Pynchon is somewhat of an enigma. He is a successful author, widely read and positively received by academia. They even made a movie out of one of his books, Inherent Vice, great movie. But his work is absurd, unconventional, labyrinthic and in all honesty, just a hard read. And it seems like the scholars who should make his work more comprehensible only want to surpass him in complexity. In those cases, interviews with the author should be helpful, but alas. Thomas Pynchon doesn't do interviews, he doesn't even allow photographs to be taken. The poor reader has only himself to rely on. But don't worry, I'm here for the rescue. In this video I will talk about two books of Pynchon and for the large part, I will dismiss them. Despite his merits, Pynchon flirts with nihilism too much. For me, this is reason enough to reject him, and I'll explain why later on in the video. Anyhow, if being a great writer means being original, being versatile, appearing profound, excelling in dropping cultural references, being susceptible to many interpretations, then he is a great writer. If being a writer means finding a way to convince the reader that heroism is possible, no matter the odds, then Pynchon is an anti-writer. I will argue the latter. Let's start off with the central book of his body of work, the blueprint for all his other novels, The Crying of Lot 49. Pynchon wrote this short novel in 1966 to buy time, so he could prepare his magnum opus, Gravity's Rainbow, which we will discuss later in the video. He basically threw the manuscript on the desk of his publisher and said, Here, a novel. Now sell it, give me cash, and stop whining. Or so I imagine. To make a short story even shorter, here's the plot. Oedipa Moss, a young housewife with a sense of adventure starts to feel the inertia of her family life when she is called upon to execute the will of her dead ex-boyfriend, the multi-millionaire Pierce in Verarity. To do this, she goes to San Narciso in California. There, she immediately cheats on her husband with Pierce's lawyer and starts an affair with him. In her efforts to get a grip on the estate of Pierce in Verarity, she meets every type of person California has to offer, weirdos, stoners, pseudoscience crackpots, and the whole lot. She starts to suspect Pierce was involved in all kinds of shadiness. A crucial point in the story is when she hears about a litigation in which someone is suing Pierce because of some bones Pierce had purchased, he needed them to make cigarette filters. When the plaintiff's lawyer tells her the whole story, the rock band that is following her around, the Paranoids, is also listening. One of its members remarks that this whole lawsuit resembles the plot of a 17th century tragedy that is now being performed. Something with stolen bones and a clandestine postal service. From that moment on, Oedipa has a suspicion there's something more behind the death of Pierce. She becomes obsessed by the play, by the postal service called W-A-S-T-E, by its emblem that starts appearing everywhere, and by a secretive network called Tristero. Every conversation she has offers new threads of the greater web she wants to unfold, but she doesn't manage to tie them together. On the contrary, this whole investigation starts to take a toll on her. Some meetings she has with informants become downright scary for her. Meanwhile, she hasn't come a single step closer to figuring it all out. Then she goes quite literally through a dark night of the soul. She wanders through the city and in the midst of a lot of parties and craziness, she sees the post horn of W.A.S.T. everywhere. She fears she's going mad. The reader expects some kind of redemption down the road, but Oedipus' demise continues unabated. When she goes home, her psychiatrist, Dr. Hilarious, appears to have gone insane and her husband is addicted to LSD. Home isn't home anymore. And back in San Narciso, her affair with Pierce's lawyer also amounted to nothing. Some informants she had spoken in California have died in the meantime. Although threads of the conspiracy web keep popping up and she can continue her research, she has no real results to show. She can only be in one of four situations. One. She's either doing too much drugs. Two, she has gone insane. Three, there really is a conspiracy. Four, Pierce has spent a small fortune to pull a post-mortem joke on her. Although she prefers option two, being insane, she goes for option three and keeps on investigating. The novel ends when Oedipa is waiting in an auction house for a secret bidder to make his bid on Lot 49, which happens to be Pierce's stamp collection. So this is the plot. Needless to say, 
The Crying of Lot 49 Paints a Dark World. The story starts off with a sad note, with her ex dying and the boredom with her bourgeois life. It's the perfect stepping stone to an adventure, so you'd think, but what awaits her is strangeness, paranoia, sinister encounters, a trail of people dying or going insane, the loss of her home and constant doubt without a resolution in sight. What really makes this story a dark one is that every chance at a breakthrough amounts to nothing. She merely ends up with another new clue that will turn out to be a dead end. Here's the issue that gets more pressing as time goes on. Does it all amount to nothing because there's nothing behind it in the first place? Or is it because whatever's behind it is masterfully hidden? Or is it because there are powers that are sabotaging her? But every option is underdetermined by the facts. She simply doesn't know enough to figure out what the truth is about the conspiracy, or about herself for that matter. Her situation is truly postmodern. She's not so much in a perpetual state of doubt, but rather in a perpetual state of doubt about her doubt. And she can't hope for redemption, because she doesn't even know for sure what the problem is. Pynchon's favorite trick is placing the reader in the same situation as the main character. The question every reader has is, what's the meaning of the novel? What message does the novel convey? Is this how the world appears to paranoid people in a culture where drugs are ubiquitous? Are there, in the real world, true conspiracies that are so intricate that we can't possibly figure them out? Or does the novel offer a reflection on the human condition, our insignificance in a reality that will always somehow evade us? In a way, like Oedipa, we are stuck with the feeling we need more information to answer all those questions. But we have already seen what happens to her when she goes out looking for more information. Everything only gets worse. Pynchon has constructed his novel very carefully so that you can construct arguments for every of the four options Oedipa deems possible, but none of them will really be compelling. It's like the existential aporia of post-war America, the setting of the story is not only Oedipa's but ours too. And this is exactly what Pynchon intended. In fact, he has already given the game away in the first chapter, when Oedipa criticizes her husband, Mucho Moss, before she leaves for San Narciso alone. Mucho used to be a second-hand car salesman, but his former job left him remorseful, a feeling he is now over-rationalizing. He feared he contributed to people's misery by selling them crappy cars that were metaphors for their lives. What Oedipus says now is the first giveaway. She says Mucho is stuck in the past. Quote, he believed too much in the lot. End quote. Lot refers not only to his former profession, but also to the title of the novel. Actually, it also refers to the idea that characters in a novel, or humans in their lives, have a destiny. It was Pynchon's intention, with all his word games, to entice the reader to overinterpretation, just to put him on a dead end, time and again. And yes, he did that with the title too. Lot 49 only refers to a trivial event at the end. But by highlighting a critique on someone who quote-unquote believed too much in the lot, we already know there's no hope for a central message. His incorrigible tendency to play with words betrays him. There is no meaning and if you believe in it, you're as naive as a second-hand car salesman who wants to improve his customers' lives. So dear reader, if you have been so gullible to have bought this book, at least the writer will have some fun with his wordplay and interpretation games, while he locks you inside a labyrinth in which you run around confused, desperately and naively looking for meaning. You'll come back empty-handed, but Pynchon will have made the profit he needs to work on his next novel. In that sense, the name of the mysterious postal company is also a giveaway, W-A-S-T-E, of which Oedipus suspects it is a shill of something more sinister. Of course, she never finds proof for this, only vague clues. It's as if Pynchon tries to hammer it down, the tendency of searching for meaning is a waste. Let me spell that out for you. W-A-S-T-E In the introduction of Pynchon's collection of short stories, Slow Learner, you can read between the lines he considers the crying of Lot 49 to be a mistake. He says that in writing the crying, he managed to unlearn everything he up until then had learned as a professional writer. There are, what did you think, lots of ways to interpret this, but here's a suggestion. The crying is too much of a blueprint of everything Pynchon's literature has to offer. So if the book is a failure, it's because it failed to conceal this purpose. In Gravity's Rainbow, published in 1973, he didn't want to repeat his mistake. 
he proceeded to obscure his intentions in a more systematic way. But with the crying in the back of our minds, we now know what he's up to. He wants the reader to feel that the search for meaning amounts to nothing, but at the same time shroud this feeling with layers of doubt to make it even worse. What is gravity's rainbow about? There are countless narrative lines that excel in complexity and purposelessness. There isn't really a central character, but if you have to pick one, it would be Slothrop. Tyrone Slothrop is an American soldier, stationed in London during World War II, while it is being bombed by V-2 rockets. There he fucks around, while other characters are having affairs, organizing seances, doing errand jobs for shady corporations, and performing iffy scientific experiments. Surrounding the V-2 rockets there's a conspiratorial mystique that will dominate almost all narratives. It's clear the rocket symbolizes an obsession with death. In that context, it's from the first chapter clear that something remarkable is going on with Slothrop. If you mark the locations where Slothrop had sex on the map of London, you get the same map as when you mark the location where the V-2 rockets landed. Even the chronology adds up. But the weird thing is this, first Slothrop has sex, a couple of days later a rocket lands on the exact same location. Slothrop is transferred to the province for a further investigation. But he soon figures out that a chemical company has conducted experiments on him when he was a baby. They conditioned him to get erections when confronted with certain stimuli. Later they deconditioned him beyond the zero. When he hears about this, he deserts from the army and goes out looking for the secret network behind all the shady organizations and companies that were involved with the experiments on baby Slothrop and in some way also revolve around the V-2 rocket. And so Slothrop wanders around in the chaos and debris of World War II Germany, just before it capitulates. He stumbles from costume party to orgy to boat trip to post-apocalyptic landscape and miraculously escapes death from time to time, channeling his inner Sean Connery. Every clue he jumps on amounts to nothing or uncovers a hyper-complex new story that doesn't make any sense, but might offer a new clue. In the end, Slothrop gives up. It's at this point that the story becomes utterly incomprehensible. Slothrop becomes the victim of a literary experiment, in which he ends up being fragmented. Where Slothrop is from now on, no one can tell for sure. Part of him can be found on a photograph, part of him lives on in an anecdote, but any coherence has evaporated from the literary character named Slothrop. What pension exactly means with all this isn't clear, but anyway the novel ends with a rocket strike in a theater. Kaboom! We can see that in the crying of Lot 49, as in Gravity's Rainbow, the same mechanism is at work. The main character can't stop the urge to figure out the secret network behind everything, but doesn't get a step closer. The reader is in the same mess and could spend hours deciphering something that's designed to be indecipherable. One difference is that in Gravity's Rainbow, Pynchon made a greater effort to complicate the plot and the narratives. His goal was to make the story impenetrable while still keeping the illusion alive that there's a system behind it we could figure out if we only had enough information. Alas, Pynchon gives neither Oedipa nor Slothrop nor us enough information, so all our efforts are for naught. If you know the quest for the meaning of the rocket plays a central part in all this, the nihilism of Pynchon becomes transparent. Remember, the rocket symbolizes the obsession with death. The quest for the meaning of death or what lies beyond appears to be as futile or doomed to fail as Slothrop's adventures. I don't know any writer who is as much deserving of the epithet postmodern as Thomas Pynchon. He tries to be as absent an author as possible. His whole bibliography is a statement against the classical story arc, against the plot, against the idea that there has to be a central, inherent meaning to the story. Even the notion of a character he has tried to deconstruct. It all fits in a postmodern view on reality, in which the world is wholly material and ultimately unknowable, and a postmodern view on the self, in which human beings ultimately don't have fixed identity. They are the mere bearers of masks, without which they are nothing. Postmodernists are also opposed to the story our culture tells about itself. If there is a story to be told about our culture, it's a dark or trivial one. Language doesn't refer to an external reality, it's a mere self-referential enterprise. Hence, the love of language games. But the thing that makes Pynchon above all else deserving of the label postmodern is his unwillingness to even offer a glimpse into what he's up to. He pushes this to such an extent that he's even actively misleading the reader. Sometimes he's dangling a carrot in front of us, a carrot of transcendence, meaning, or hope. 
In Against the Day, for example, there are several passages in which characters gaze at the horizon, and it's like they are looking at a colliding of two worlds. Some passages are really touching, like in this text wall about the fatherhood of an activist anarchist mine worker, or about an affair in the debris of London in Gravity's Rainbow. But it's all a sham. So why is it a sham? A central theme in his work, that is even a short story named after it, is entropy. Entropy refers to the second law of thermodynamics. In nature, closed systems tend to a maximal state of disorder, or entropy. This includes the universe as a whole, since it's a closed system. In the vast plane of sheer blind nothingness, there seems to be one little dot in which there is something resembling order. What are the odds? On this minuscule dot there are creatures for whom everything is full of purpose. We act purposefully, we think purposefully. While in the whole universe nothing seems to be directed at anything at all. Again, what are the odds that we happen to live in an opposite reality to the rest of the universe? No wonder you gaze at the horizon and start contemplating the possibility of another world. However, if Pynchon showed his hand, he would give us the following answer, or non-answer. Entropy is similar to shuffling cards. Achieving an ordered set by shuffling cards is not impossible, just very unlikely. But shuffle enough, and eventually it happens. If you end up being the guy who, after some shuffling, has a perfectly ordered stack, which no one seems to experience, the temptation is very strong to suspect that there is something more behind it. Our brains are hungry for conspiracies. But likewise, the creation of our planet with its life-friendly conditions and the development of our species and culture is just another reshuffle in the row. It's a lucky coincidence. And that's the end of the matter. But atheist physicists might add something to this picture. It is precisely in the one place that happened to be ordered in a way that makes conscious life possible that you can expect people to question the meaning of their existence. That's why Pynchon's characters see colliding of worlds. That is why there seems to be a moment of love in war-torn London. Small mercies are possible, wrote an interpreter of Pynchon. It's a statement about a minor character in Gravity's Rainbow, the German boy Ludwig who has lost his lemming Ursula just before the end of the war. He goes out into the chaos to find his pet. The odds are bad. Lemmings are notoriously suicidal and Germany is large and dangerous. But eventually Ludwig succeeds and finds his Ursula. Quote, so not all lemmings go over the cliff. To expect any more, or less, of the zone is to disagree with the terms of the creation. Unquote. Small mercies are possible indeed, but only if you shuffle the deck enough. But is it hope? I think not. Passages as this one are the crumbs we have scavenged in a universe where there is no hope or purpose. It is utterly coherent with the postmodern, nihilistic framework of Pynchon. He wouldn't consider himself a credible writer if he didn't throw a bone once in a while to those who still believe in heroism and hope. Anyhow, the last word about God's dices has not been spoken, and there are still some pieces of the puzzle missing. Wikipedia pointed me to a review of Against the Day that featured Pynchon's style. The text exceeds our ability to keep everything in our heads, to take it all in at once. There is too much going on among too many characters in too many places. This, including tone shifts in which Pynchon spoofs various styles of popular literature, was all surely part of the intention, a simulation of the disorienting overload of modern culture. Obviously, this also applies to Gravity's Rainbow. Pynchon tries really hard not to develop narrative arcs. And when that's impossible, he makes them as anticlimactic as possible. If the reader experiences chaos and confusion, well, that's because reality too is confusing and chaotic. In this way we follow countless characters, who have the most absurd experiences, like Koch Borgesius. She seems to be a mere literary tool to an abstract reflection, or a standby actor in case a real character is needed somewhere to fill a narrative hole. Moreover, what makes the book so incomprehensible are all the pseudoscientific and technological digressions, cultural and historical allusions, branches of companies, sections of armies, sub-intrigues that are always introduced as possibly a crucial part of the great conspiracy, but never turn out to be helpful. We are witnesses of a fight against consistency, comprehensibility, and of course, the story. My whole issue with this brand of postmodernism is that literature should aspire to be more than mere intellectual entertainment. 
literature should strike a chord in the reader to rally him around values that matter. You could say it is not original to write a story that incites a reader to embark on his own hero's journey, but ironically that's not an original critique. Since the dawn of time, stories with a plot and a positive transformation of the main character are captivating. Today, on the other hand, it is clear that readers and viewers are getting fed up with the forced subversion of all the elements of classical storytelling. Nor does it bring any insight. It conveys the feeling that you have thought about complex matters. But do you really learn something about our society, except that it is very complex? That our society is marked by contradictions? Do you gain insight into the confusion that exists in our society? Or does Pynchon merely show what it is to be confused, like he's doing you a favor? The reader learns, by one big mindfuck, that the knot in which reality is tied is inextricable, as he stumbles upon scientific digressions, cultural references, and conspiracy theories. There is another option. Literature could remain faithful to having a plot and meaningful character transformation. It could be aspiring to be a chapter in the story of our culture. Dare I say this form of literature has more to offer. I for myself prefer this to the exploits of a writer who places himself outside the culture, with the intention of appearing smart, all the while making a case for nihilism in the heart of the reader. Apart from the case you can make against it, this whole aesthetic of nihilism has already been exhausted by Beckett anyway. This is a point I stole from Camille Paglia. All the postmodernists have done is add humor to Godot and hide the worldview that expresses it. The great irony of Pynchon's sabotage of the classic story structure is that he too cannot escape the archetypes. Both The Crying of Lot 49 and Gravity's Rainbow in the end do show a remarkable similarity to a basic plot called Overcoming the Monster. This plot is found in countless stories like Gilgamesh, Beowulf, Dracula, The Hobbit, the James Bond franchise in Terminator. It goes like this. Gradually, the hero becomes aware of a great danger threatening him. He encounters the formidable, almost indestructible monster. When he finally confronts it, he nearly gets annihilated until he has a Hail Mary moment and defeats the monster. The most similar example of this plot to Pynchon's novels might be the Hydra of Luna. Whenever Oedipa or Slothrop uncover something about the plot, complications appear that further jeopardize unmasking of the network. Similarly, whenever Hercules decapitates one head of the Hydra, three new heads of the Hydra appear. The difference is that with Pynchon the characters never have a Hail Mary moment and there is never a denouement. Imagine Hercules never makes the decision to hit the beast in the neck. In the exact same way the crying of Lot 49 remains unfinished. And in the exact same way Slothrop's storyline ends abruptly. But for some reason Pynchon added a literary experiment on the end that makes no sense at all. Probably Pynchon was dissatisfied with the fact that there only are a handful of ways to end a story. Every ending you choose is doomed not to be original. Channeling his inner adolescent, he fabricated a new sort of ending that resolves nothing at all. I'm sure it's interesting for those who are so open-minded that their brains are in danger of falling out. But others might just say WTF. Pynchon has tried to escape the narrative, often in an irritatingly systematic way, by sabotaging a smooth reading experience, by initiating narrative threads, but never developing them properly. All in all, he failed in his endeavor. In the end, all he has to offer is an unfinished story. The Linnean Hydra never gets finished off. In Gravity's Rainbow, he tried to do something new at the end, but failed miserably. The crying of Lot 49 is cut short at the end. As a reader, you're left with the feeling that the story is untold. A degree of unsatisfaction remains. This is not what a story should be. This is not what literature should be. As a writer you can try to escape the plot, but in reality there is no escape. If you try too hard, your art will only contribute to nihilism or fail. In Pynchon's case, there is a case to be made for both. 